Hello. Um, man, I can't believe this is our last time together. Uh, but hopefully it won't be our last time and, and we can continue to learn together, learn something new. Um, so let's take a look at where we've been. So our first week, we looked at um, like really what is Torah, my Torah, M-A-I. Um, and, uh, you know, we explored it in, in different ways. Um, different traditional ways, like literally what are its components with Samson, Raphael, Hirsch, and, and that beautiful midrash from Ellen Frankel. And then last week we looked at um, sort of the next level of, okay, so how does Torah, you know, function in my life as an individual? And that was a fantastic conversation. Thank you all. Um, I'm certainly not a Kaplan scholar, um, but it was, you know, fantastic to revisit those texts with you and to like really think about his, in, in his impact on American Jewish theology. And, um, you know, I finally, I finally found that the right article, so I'm glad that I was able to send it over to Julie. Um, okay, so today we're going to look at um, my Torah, and this time it's actually M-Y Torah. And um, we're going to look at Midrash. And Midrash is called um, Black Fire, on white fire and the black fire is like uh, talking about like a page of torah the black fire are, is the ink or the words the torah tab, the written torah and the white fire are the spaces between where we get to fill in the the white space with the story that's between the letters and between the words so we're going to look at <laughs> only two texts um, and like when I was planning this, I had like five texts and I was like, I couldn't do five. I need like a five week session to do all these five texts. So we're going to ambitiously try to get through two texts, um, to really understand the nature of the nature of Torah. Um, and if we have time, I would love to, to do an activity. So I wanted to start with on the handout that first text. Um, and I will be sharing my screen because um, one of the very important things of Torah study and any form of Torah is going back to the sources. And I think I've said this before, really understanding first, what is the context? What's the original context? And then it gives us a greater appreciation for what the rabbis and the, the darshanim, the, those who are writing the midrash, are, are trying to accomplish. And let me take one more step back and then I'll take three steps forward, um, to, to look at the word itself, midrash. And midrash is from the Hebrew root lidrosh, which is to, to go deep, to explore, to seek, to search. So the act of midrash is seeking out something, seeking meaning, seeking to uh, find the question that the text is answering, seeking to explain the situation that the text is happening in, the, the context that's there in the white fire, or perhaps it's seeking a voice that's not present in the text. Um, and so a darshan is one who is doing that work of seeking. Okay, so let's make a blessing and let us, let's go. Baruch Ata Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Kedushim Vitzvotav Vitzivanu La'asok B'divrei Torah. Thank you, God, for helping us to be better people by giving us this holy mitzvah of engaging with Torah study. May these words and this teaching be rich and nourishing for our souls. And may we take them into ourselves to continue to refresh and renew our relationship with Torah, with divine word, and with the Holy One of blessing. And may we continue to merit lives that allow us to just study Torah in, in the middle of our day. Please, God, what a blessing. What a merit. Baruch ata Adonai, Amen Torah. Israel. Okay, so step one. Let's look at the text. 
and let me share my screen. You know what? Um, I'm not going to share my screen with the uh, with the texts because it's going to be like a lot to shift back and forth. You know what? Yes, I will. Why not? I'll just share it with the text. <laughs> I can I can talk and chew gum at the same time. Let's see. Uh, preview share screen. Okay, so here we go. Um, let me move us over to this side of the screen. So uh, this is your source sheet, black fire on white fire. And so we're starting with um, Bereshit Rabbah 1-1. Now Bereshit Rabbah is, uh, or all of the, the Rabbahs, our Midrash Rabbah is a collection of Torah, excuse me, a collection of Midrash on the books of Torah and actually the Tanakh because there's um, Kohelet Rabbah, Ecclesiastes Rabbah, there's, um, there's commentaries on most of these, uh, of the books of the Tanakh, not commentaries, I'm sorry, Midrashim, and, well, Midrashim are commentaries, on most of the books of the Tanakh. So this one is particularly on Genesis, and it's on um, the very, one, one, it's the beginning, beginning of Genesis. So um, let's take a look first at the, uh, at the text. I'm going to put you up to top, that's easiest. Uh, Genesis, I'm just pulling up the text. That's easy enough. Stop share and start again. <laughs> okay. So here we are. Bereshit 1 1. Bereshit bara Elohim et hashamayim et haaretz. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It's pretty standard. That's like how it's usually translated. Sometimes it's you know, in a beginning, sometimes it's, but it's usually in the beginning. That's, that's what we know. Bereshit, it's our origin story, etc. Okay, so let's jump into the Midrash. Okay, so it starts with the great Rabbi Hoshaya opened. Oh, I need to move this so I can see the clock. The great Rabbi Hoshaya opened. Uh, now, uh, most Midrash, not most, a lot of Midrashim start with this. Um, and this word open, it plays two roles. One, it's that this is, it opens like this is the beginning. He's starting with this text, but also it speaks to the nature of Midrash in that it's opening something up for us. And we'll see at the end what the great Rabbi Hoshaya is opening up for us. So he opened with the verse from Mishlei, the I, the Torah, was an Amon to him, and I was a plaything to him every day. So this is a, a quote from Proverbs, and um, it's just, it, it, oh, sorry, my phone is buzzing. Um, the quote from Proverbs, and um, this is the quote that we have. And um, in the text, it doesn't say, in, the, in Proverbs, it doesn't say the Torah. It just says, I was an Amon to him, and I was a plaything to him every day. The Darshan is filling that in to teach us that this is, this is the Torah speaking and saying that I hung out with God all the time. Um, Amon means, now what's Amon is the question. Uh, Amon means pedagogue, like a nanny. Amon means covered. Amon means hidden. And there are some who say Amon means great. Now the Darshan is going to open it up. Uh, Amon means nanny, as in Bamidbar 11.12. Uh, a nanny, Omain, carries the suckling child. As a nanny, Omain carries the suckling child. So let's go look at that um, context, because that's important for us. So that's the Midbar 11, uh, 12. Do, do, do. 11, 12. Okay. So we see from the, con oh, I'm not sharing my screen. Sorry. <laughs> okay, now we see from the, con we can see the context. Um, so Moses is atop the mountain and, you know, the people are fetching, you know, <laughs> nothing new. And um, Moses and God are going back and forth. And they had just gotten, you see in verse seven, they had just gotten, uh, mana, and they're excited, um, but like, uh, 
you know, we know the story of them. They please don't go out and get the mana. They go out and get the mana. It's like, I told you not to do that. Um, so Moses is pretty fed up. And he says right here in verse 12, have I conceived all these people? Have I brought them forth that you should say to me, carry them in thy bosom as a nursing father carries the suckling child? And that's our verse. Um, uh, Ka'asher, in Hebrew, Ka'asher Yisa Ha'omen, that's the word, the Amon that we're playing with. Um, Carry them in thy bosom as a nursing father carries the suckling child unto the land which you did swear to their fathers. I love this English. Um, but like, I, was I their, was I their, uh, their, their guide, their, their caretaker, their wet nurse? So that's one image that we, that we hold, um, Torah as wet nurse. All right, let's come back and do the test. Share my screen. Okay. The next text, um, Amon means covered, as in Echa, lamentations, those who were covered and Monim in scarlet have embraced refuse heaps. So we don't have to run to the, to the context. For, I'm, I'm trying to save us those transition times. Um, but Torah is something that's hidden, something that is shielded as well. Um, he hid away, excuse me, Amon means hidden, as in Esther 2.7, he hid away Omein Hadassah. Right, and so this is sort of building on all of the images before us because we have Hadassah, right? <coughs> Excuse me, for whom Mordechai was an Omei, really, right? Mordechai was a nurse for Hadassah. Our Midrash elsewhere tells us that he, uh, he suckled her. He, made him, he was able to lactate, which is why I would tell my husband, like, you too can get up in the middle of the night and nurse the baby. If, if Mordechai could do it, you could too. He never tried, it didn't work, but the Midrash says it's possible. Um, and then it also, you know, we have this concept of hidden, which is, you know, this similar but slightly different concept from shelf, from, um, what's the word, from covered, right? Like there are depths that need to be mined in order to get the riches out. And finally, Amon means great, as in Nahum. Are you better than no Amon? which dwells in the rivers. Okay, so what's no Amon? And I struggled with this in rabbinical school because we were, we, were, we were learning this, we were newbies. Um, so no Amon refers to here, Alexandria the Great, as in Greece, which dwells between the rivers. Alternatively, Amon means artisan. The Torah is saying, I was the artisan's tool. I was the artisan's tool of Hashem. Um, so let's look at these. We've got what, five, one? We've got like five um, images. We've got Torah as um, wet nurse, right? Something that we or God can use to get sustenance. That's kind of novel to think about the Torah as giving God sustenance. Um, Torah as something covered and modest. The Torah as something hidden meaning that we have to work to access it and to find it. And perhaps it's not available directly to everyone. We've got the Torah as uh, great, as in big and powerful and commanding, literally, like Greece was in the, uh, in the days of old. And so uh, we end with the artisan concept. Um, I was the artisan's tool of Hashem, as it says. And when we think about an artisan, um, it's, what, it, it's what they use to create, right? It's how the masterpieces, it, it's the, the link between the artist and the masterpiece that is created. So when we think of God as the artist and this world that's created, and Torah is the tool, Torah is that link. So. Here's how the Midrash opens that concept. 
in the way of the world, a king of flesh and blood who builds a castle does not do so from his own knowledge, but rather from the knowledge of an architect. And the architect does not build it from his own knowledge, but rather he has scrolls and books in order to know how to make rooms and doorways. Right? Okay. So we have a person and you want to build a house, you call someone who knows how to build a house. I wish I could build a house. I, you know, I'd be rich if I could do those kinds of things, but I don't. I turn to someone else who knows. And that person wasn't born into the world as an architect. They studied and they learned and they were an apprentice and that gave them the knowledge to do what they do. That's the way of the human world. So too, Hashem gazed into the Torah and created the world, right? So if that's how it works down here, perhaps we can use a similar analogy to understand how it works in the heavens. Similarly, the Torah says, through reshit, Hashem created the heavens and the earth. Now, in Hebrew, be can mean through, and reshit is a, is a word. It means wisdom. Um, as we see here in Mishle, now we're going to take a look at this context because it's important. Uh, so I think this is like the key to how Midrash works. Mishle, eight, 22, correct? Yes, 22. So it says, uh, the Lord made me as the beginning of his way, the first of his works of old. I was set up from everything from the beginning or ever the earth was. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. There were no fountains abounding with water. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Oh, I wasn't, I never shared my screen. I'm sorry. <laughs> Let me share that really quickly so you can see what I was looking at. Okay, here I am. Verse 22, the Lord made me, um, Yud Hey Vav Hey Kanani Reshit Darko at the beginning of his way, Kedem Mifalav Meaz, the first of his works of old. Right, so that's where we learn that this Torah, that the Torah, was the first thing that was created according to the Midrash, according to what we've seen, because the Darshan has called this voice here in Mishlei in Proverbs. The Torah. Now, when we look at, you know, scroll up to verse 12, Ani, Hochma, I, wisdom, blah, 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 we see that in the context of Proverbs, it's about wisdom, scam, like just wisdom in general. But it's not that far of a leap to say, well, Torah is wisdom, right? So if this is talking about wisdom, then this is talking about Torah. So we understand down here in verse 22, Reshit is wisdom. So back to our text with a, a wrap up of the Starshan. Be reshit Hashem created the heavens and the earth. With wisdom or with Torah, Hashem created the heavens and the earth. And so the Darshan has opened for us the first word of the Torah. We usually translate it as in the beginning. No, now he is saying when we read Bereshit, we understand that God created the heavens and the earth with the Torah, the Torah as um, a wet nurse, the Torah as uh, something hidden, the Torah as something covered, the Torah as something great and commanding. All of those ca categories and characteristics of Torah exist in our world, in the written Torah, and then the Torah Shabbat El Pei, because that's how it came into being. Okay. So that's just an, one example <laughs> of how the rabbis open up every word or every letter of Torah through the power of Midrash and weaving together other verses uh, and texts and context to tell, to tell one story. Um, so I want to turn to um, modern Midrash because really I, I didn't have an appreciation for the traditional Midrash until I really encountered the modern Midrash and I worked, I worked backwards. So, um, oh, let me stop sharing my screen. 
do, do, for a moment. Um, so we're going to be looking shortly at Anita Diamond's The Red Tent. I think it looks like it's backwards. Um, but um, in order to really understand, and, and this isn't, it's not that old, but you know, it's kind of, it's kind of old text. Let's see, when is this from? 1997. Oi, va, voi. Um, this is from 1997. Um, but there are still plenty of people who have not read it and my face drops to the floor and I'm like, oh my God, you have to read The Red Dead. It like totally changes it for me. It changed how I look at Torah and I never take anything at face value and I'm always looking for the voices. And I want to show you a little bit of what the traditional rabbis did and what she did as well and how that works. So back into my screen share, do, do, do. share screen. Fire, white fire. Okay. So, ah, gray sheet. Uh, back to Genesis, chapter twenty-seven. Excuse me, twenty-nine, uh, verses sixteen and seventeen. Now, Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah. The name of the younger was Rachel. Leah had weak eyes. Rachel was shapely and beautiful. That's it. That's what we get about. Uh, a description of Leah and Rachel. Um, so there's plenty of room for Midrash in here. Leah had weak eyes. What does that mean? Rachel was shapely and beautiful. What does that mean? We could spend like an hour looking at both of those. We're going to just zoom in right here on Leah had weak eyes. So let's look at the commentary, uh, Rashi, Rashi, 11th century commentator commenting out of France. So, um, and you know, Rashi was absolutely fantastic. He was on the cusp of the, um, the, the end of the rabbinic period. And so, the, and so he was really able to, to carry all of the, the rabbinic ideals and the rabbinic mindset and bring it to the people in his commentaries. So Rashi says, um, tender, right? Some translations uh, translate, we, uh, Leah had weak eyes, or the word rakot as, or ene rakot, as uh, weak. He's, Rashi's, or this translation is calling it tender. So here's what he had to say. Why are the eyes tender? She thought she would have to fall to the lot of Asaph, and she therefore wept continually because everyone said, well, Rebecca has two daughters. Lavan, Rebecca has two sons. Lavan has two daughters. The elder daughter for the elder son and the younger daughter for the younger son. So it would have made sense that she was supposed to marry Asav. And so for that reason, the Midrash that Rashi is bringing, because it doesn't say this anywhere in the text, and it's quoting here Genesis Rabbah, which we just studied, um, says that she, her eyes were just weak and tender and sore from all of that crying that she had to do because God forbid she would have to marry Asa. Okay, that's one way of understanding it. In fact, you know, that's a, a common midrash that circulates. So I'm gonna stop my screen share and we're gonna jump into the red tent. And you see at the bottom of your uh, source sheet, I'm reading page uh, 11. Now, this is a lot and I was going to put it up, but you know what? It's Midrash and it's Torah Shabbat al right? It's the Torah of the mouth. So I'm going to read this to you. And you can feel free to close your eyes if you want and just listen, right? Thinking about what we just heard from the Torah, Rashi's Midrash. Now we're going to hear Anita Diamond's Midrash. <clears throat> My mother nodded and turned to face the first grown man who did not look away when confronted by the sight of her eyes. Leah's vision was perfect. According to one of the more ridiculous fables embroidered around my family's history, she ruined her eyes by crying a river of tears over the prospect of marrying my uncle Asa. If you believe that, you might also be interested in purchasing a magical toad that will make all who look upon you swoon with love. But my mother's eyes were not weak or sick or roomy. The truth is 
Her eyes made others weep. And most people looked away rather than face them. One blue as puppies, the other green as Egyptian grass. When she was born, the midwife cried out that a witch had been brought forth and should be drowned before she could bring a curse on the family. But my grandmother, Ada, slapped the stupid woman and cursed her tongue. Show me my daughter, said Ada, in a voice so loud and proud, even the men outside could hear her. Ada named her beloved lastborn Leah, which means mistress. And she wept a prayer that this child would live, for she had buried seven sons and daughters. There were plenty who remained convinced that the baby was a devil. For some reason, Lavan, who is the most superstitious soul you can imagine, spitting and bowing whenever he turned to the left, howling at every lunar eclipse, refused to hear suggestions that Leia be left outside to die in the night air. He swore some mild oath about the femaleness of this child. But apart from that, Lavan ignored his daughter and never mentioned her distinction. Then again, the women suspected the old man could not see color at all. Leia's eyes never faded in color as some of the women predicted and hoped, but became brighter in their difference and even more pronounced in their strangeness when her lashes failed to grow. Although she blinked like everyone else, the reflex was nearly invisible, so it seemed that Leia never closed her eyes. Even her most loving glance felt a bit like the stare of a snake, and few could stand to look her straight in the eye. Those who could were rewarded with kisses and laughter and bread wet with honey. Jacob met Leah's eyes straight on, and for this, she warmed to him instantly. In fact, Leah had already taken note of Jacob on account of his height. She was half a head taller than most of the men she had ever seen, and she dismissed them all because of it. She knew this was not fair. Surely there were good men among those whose heads reached only to her nose. But the thought of lying with anyone whose legs were shorter and weaker than her own disgusted her. Not that anyone had asked for her. She knew they all called her lizard, an evil eye, and worse. I'm going to skip just a little bit to get to the e car and keep it on, the, uh, on her eyes. Leia's scent was no mystery. She smelled of the yeast she handled daily, brewing and baking. She reeked of bread and comfort, and it seemed to Jacob of sex. He stared at this giantess and his mouth watered. As far as I knew, he never said a word about her eyes. So, you know, we have this story, which I forgot to give you a little bit of the context. It's the story of um, Dina, uh, who, in, again, in the, in the Torah is just like a one dimensional character. And um, she's very passive, doesn't have a voice and uh, everything happens to her. But in the red tent, it, it's her story. And it's her experience of everything that happened. And it's totally different from traditional commentaries and totally different from the way that we're taught this story. So even just looking at her background and the story of Leah, her, her mother, um, we see a, a version that is much more empowering than the version that we've had in our in our midrash. And I think I know, you know, a lot of women have been able to find their voices or the, and the voices of women in our in our past through the midrash. Now, I was just so blessed the other day to speak at a, a gathering of uh, black clergy here in Boston. Um, and, you know, one of the pastors, Pastor Reverend Mariana Hammond, she, she preached that, um, that it wasn't that the, uh, the male writers of the Torah intended to leave out the women and the, the sheroes, as she called them, of the Torah. It's just that they ran out of ink. So we have to see what they intended to write. Right, and so uh, that's exactly it. That's the concept of the white fire. I, they just didn't have the ink, but here's what they meant to put in. And you know, it's very powerful to think about it like that. And that's really what Midrash has done, is allowed us to look into the text, given us the tools through traditional study, given us the tools to say, <clears throat> let's open this text up. Where are the voices we're not hearing? Right, like so Anita Diamond in her reading, 
who is this Dina and why is she a passive character and why does this, these huge life events happen around her and she has no voice? What was she thinking? What was her experience? And from that, um, uh, Anita Diamond uh, made this this whole beautiful book. And she's not the only one, right? There is tons of his biblical historic midrash where people take characters, like for instance, Tipora, Moses's wife, and say, oh my God, you're mentioned like twice in the Torah and you're Moses's wife. Like what, what was that experience like? And they build the world for, for Tipora, or they, they open Tipora's world for us to be able to explore. I see one person wrote, who wrote the Midrash? And Midrash is written by Darshanim, by rabbis and scholars who um, are receiving Torah, are in the tradition of Torah and are able to, like, like, like Reverend Hammond said, who are able to see what the writers may have ran out of ink to write. So I want to... I, I just want to bring us to one last midrash, which I forgot to bring in with me. So I'm just going to run out and grab it. Here it is. And uh, I want to bring us back to the, the midrash that we started with. And, um, you know, if we were in person, you would have had a card. Um, yes, yes. Mara Halter. Um, if, is in the chat, um, wrote lots of books about women in the Bible. Fantastic book. I love those books. Um, I encourage you to, to look them up. He's got one for Tipora, one for Sarah, and one for someone else I can't remember. But they're, they're fantastic books and really change how we, how we understand our narrative and how, how we are able to go into it. Um, and one of the things that I wanted to do with us today, but I, we're you know, almost out of time and I wanna conclude with this, this other midrash, um, is looking at the Torah portion or you know, any, any piece of Torah that you're seeking to understand and asking the question, what is their, what's, what is their perspective? There being absolutely anything in the scene. And that's a practice that I did uh, with <clears throat> Rabbi Goldie Milgram. Um, and at that time we were learning the, the Akedah, the binding of Isaac, and telling the story from the perspective of the ram <laughs> in the thicket, you know, minding his own business. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, you know, being uh, taken. What was the perspective of the knife in the story? What was the perspective of the young people, the young boys who were left at the bottom. What, what did they think was happening? And most, most importantly, you know, uh, maybe not most importantly, but most, most powerfully, what was Sarah's perspective in all of that? Um, and thankfully we do, have, we do have midrash at least on what Sarah's perspective was and what happened. Um, but as we said, the question is today is, you know, my Torah, M-Y, my Torah. So how do we, how do you uh, approach Torah? How do you see Torah? How do you use your skills? And, you know, being in this tradition, it, it belongs, it belongs to us, right? We, we are able to do this. How do we tell the story of the white fire? And how do we open up words and bring out their meaning? How do we give voice to the voiceless in our text? So I want to bring us back to, um, oh, um, the books that, the, the, uh, I'm just checking out the chat. The books were by um, Marek Halter, M-A-R-E-K-H-A-L-T-E-R. -E um, there's a book called Sarah. There's a book called Tipora. And I can't remember who the other person is. Uh, it was also, was it Yocheven? Um, is absolutely fantastic. So I want to bring us back to the first midrash that we really opened with, which is um, Ellen Frankel, uh, by Ellen Frankel from the Five Books of Miriam, a woman's commentary on the Torah. And it will close our course the same way we opened it. Before the world was created, 
I was. Before the sun was formed on the fourth day, I illuminated the void. My words provided the blueprint for creation and they contain the script for redemption. To some, I speak only the word of God transcribed at Sinai and echoing down through the centuries in the words of the rabbis. To others, I myself am but the echo of the bot kol, the divine voice, filtered through the imperfect hearing of those who revere the one who speaks truth. To yet others, I am black fire on white fire, my entire body of letters, a single name of God, and even that name, only the outer garment of the Holy One. Still others regard me as a patchwork of human voices, sewn together by an expert seamstress. But my guises are inexhaustible. Always there are spaces between the letters, gaps yawning wide for new tales. The tradition teaches she is a tree of life to all who hold fast to her, and I am. So thank you, thank you so much for learning with me these three weeks. Uh, I deeply, deeply appreciate it. And I think, do we have a moment for a Q&A, some questions? Yeah, okay. Yes. If anyone has a comment or question, um, please let me know by chat that you want to be unmuted um, or you can put your question in the um, or use the raise hand function. Someone's asking about the, the midrash that Sarah died uh, upon hearing about the Akedah. Mm -hmm. Yes. So there is a midrash. Yeah, you had more of a question about I'll just say a little bit about there is a midrash that um, the Satan, the adversary of Satan, the devil, however we want to call it, but you know, in Hebrew, it's just the Satan, the adversary, um, adversary came to um, Sarah while the Akedah was happening and said, Do you know what Abraham's doing right now? <laughs> and, uh, you know, she said, You know, no, he's off on one of his crazy Abraham trips. And, uh, he told her everything that was happening from, from a, a jaded perspective, like Abraham's up there trying to kill your son. And, you know, can you imagine, like already this poor woman, you know, had to pick up and go when Abraham was like, when God was like Lech Lecha, right? And had to leave everything and then went to Egypt twice. And he was like, just pretend you're my sister. Um, and she was kidnapped and God knows what happened to her. Um, the first time, or maybe it's the second time, um, God, it says God protected her, but we don't know what happened the other time. And Abraham was, you know, the tent was always open. She had to go run and make cakes, all this stuff. Abraham was just like on his crazy spiritual trip. So like the end of it all to say like, Abraham's there trying to sacrifice your son to his God. And it says in that moment, her spirit left her. So pretty powerful because, and because right after the Akedah, the next Parsha we have is Chaye Sarah, where she dies. So the rabbis, the Darshanim are saying, well, it's because we can, we can infer when things are next to each other in the Torah that they're kind of causative, we can infer that that was her response to the Akedah. What's the craziest Midrash ever written? <laughs> oh, oh, that's not really Midrash kind of midrash the craziest midrash i think is ever written is in brachot and it's about a guy who's wearing tzitzit and um his he's like um you know the purpose of tzitzit is to keep us you know on the derrick on the path and to remind us of the mitzvot so this guy is about to sleep with uh, another woman about to commit adultery and his tzitzit come to life and i imagine they have like eyes and everything and like one tzitzit just comes and smacks him in the face and like, he, he's like, oh, and he just like remembers, oh my God, this is a, an avera. I shouldn't be doing this. And he turns his life around. So I call it the, you know, magical anthropomorphized tzitzit. Um, and that's one of my favorite <laughs> wacky, it's not really a midrash. Um, I mean, I guess it could be a, a midrash halakha on why we wear tzitzit. Um, <laughs> but uh, 
I, it's, it's one of my favorite wacky stories. Sharon had a question or a comment. Yeah. Um, oh, thanks. I was interested when you said um, that Hashem gazed into the Torah and created the world. But the I wondered about the juxtaposition or the order of that, because how is it that Hashem gazed into the Torah when Hashem uh, didn't write the Torah? I mean, Moshe wrote the Torah based on what Hashem had said to him. So I was interested in that juxtaposition of and the order of it. Did Hashem gaze into the Torah that he had already written? How did? What's your understanding of that? It's an excellent question. So one of the principles of um, Torah exegesis is that there's there's no before and after in Torah, meaning okay. um, sometimes the order of things. Uh, muddles our understand our ability to understand things. In this case, you know, we're not talking about the Torah scroll per se as we have it. We're talking about primordial Torah, like the the essential Torah, the blueprint of creation, and it's the same essential Torah that. You know, we we're able to talk about a couple of weeks ago when we asked, like, how is it possible that Abraham was, and that was last week, how is it possible that, that Abraham was able to keep all of the Torah before a Torah had been given, right? He just knew in his kishkas what the Torah was. So God in his, in God's creation, I don't say his because that's what it says in the Midrash, God in God's creation, creative process of the world needed some guidance and that guidance was this primordial torah this primordial blueprint as you will as like an architect has a blueprint the torah was god's blueprint for creation